thanks everyone for coming. I'm so happy you're here. I'm Luis Jaramillo, the interim director of the School of Writing here at the New School. I've had the pleasure of working with Cave Canem since 1999. So many of the Cave Canem readings stand out as the liveliest, most politically engaged, and most moving events of the many dozens of events we host here each year. I'm honored that we at the New School continue our long-term partnership with Cave Canem and to welcome our friends back for our first co-sponsored event of the year. Please join us here next week for the second event. Uh, Cave Canem presents Poets on Craft with Natalie Handel and Frank X. Walker. And now I'd like to turn the evening over to Allison Myers, the Executive Director of Cave Canem. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's so great to see you here. And I just want to uh, mention that uh, Natalie Handel will converse with A. Van Jordan, who is substituting for Frank X, but it'll be fantastic, so do come. So it is a pleasure and privilege to introduce tonight's poets, Camila Aisha Moon and Roger Reeves, two emerging voices with newly published first books who bring us fresh ways of thinking about poetry. And Kwame Dawes, whose new collection reveals a mature poet at the height of his creative and intellectual powers. As always, we're grateful to the New School for sponsoring our new works reading and hosting us beautifully, with special thanks to Luis and Lori Lynn Turner. This evening, I'll first introduce our two rising stars, Roger and Camila, who will read in that order, then return to the podium to introduce Kwame. A 2013 NEA National Endowment for the Arts Fellow, Roger Reeves' first book of poems, King Me, just published by Copper Canyon Press, has been praised as muscular, gritty, at times confrontational, but always rooted in human interactions and emotional life. His poems use the reader's discomfort with the subject matter to revel in the art of the everyday. Roger's work has appeared or is forthcoming in such journals as Poetry, Plowshares, American Poetry Review, Boston Review, and Tin House. His poem, Cletic of Walt Whitman was selected for the Best New Poets 2009. A Cave Canem Fellow, he is the recipient of a Pushcart Prize, a Ruth Lilly Fellowship awarded by the Poetry Foundation, two Breadloaf Scholarships, and the Alberta H. Walker Scholarship from Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. He earned his PhD at the University of Texas and is currently an assistant professor of poetry at the University of Illinois, Chicago. A Brooklyn resident, Camila Aisha Moon, is the author of She Has a Name, just released by Four, Way, Four Ways Books. I've had the distinct honor of becoming familiar with this compelling manuscript as it deepened and took shape, and couldn't be more thrilled that the final product has earned a spot on Four Ways Fine List. Camila is a devoted and open-hearted Cave Canem Fellow, a consistent presence at others' readings, encouraging and applauding the work of peers and mentees. A recipient of fellowships to the Prague Summer Writing Institute, the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, and the Vermont Studio Center, her work has been featured in several journals and anthologies, among them Harvard Review, Jubilat, Oxford American, Callaloo, Villanelle's Gathering Ground, and the Ringing Ear Black Poets Lean South. She holds an MFA in creative writing from Sarah Lawrence College and is a teacher of English and creative writing at various institutions and organizations, including Cave Canem. Please join me now in welcoming Roger Reeves. Before diagnosis, the lake is dead for a second time this January, and no matter how many geese lay their warm breast against the ice or fly across its hard chest, it doesn't break or sink or open up and swallow them. The ice is frozen water. There is no metaphor for exile. Even if these trees continue to shake the crows from their branches, my sister is still farther away from her mind than we are from each other, sitting on opposite ends of a park bench, waiting for the evening to swallow us whole. In the last moments of depressive 
a son. In the last moments of a son, my sister says a man is chasing a goose through the snow. I want to thank Kaveh Khanum uh, for having me. Uh, I, always, I, I feel like this, this reading is kind of special because Kaveh Khanum was the first time that I got accepted somewhere as a poet uh, back in 2003. Uh, and that was my first year. And I, I'll never forget the, my first workshop. Uh, and it was my first ever workshop. <laughs> uh, so uh, I thank Kaveh Khanum for believing in me, the organization, and the friends uh, back in 2003. Uh, where this sort of all began. And I would like to uh, dedicate this reading to uh, Trayvon Martin. This next poem, The Mayor of Money, it's for Emmett Till. Another dead mayor waits in the shoals of some body of water, waits to be burdened, born into a foaming ocean where it might become food for whales or simply empty signifier, hair latched to the sea's undulation like Absalom's beauty caught in the playful branches of a tree desiring union, entanglement, thick confusion. But not this mare. She does not get the luxury of a lyric, a song that makes our own undoing or killing sweet even as we go down into the fire to rise as smoke. This horse must lie, eyes open among the stone and freshwater crawfish and money, Mississippi. She must listen to the men's boots break the water as they drop a black boy's body near her head, pick him up, only to let him fall there again, eye to eye with her, as though decaying is something that requires a witness. As though the mayor might say, on Tuesday after the rain fell, the boy's neck finally snapped from the weight of the mill fan. He never looked at me again. Or the boy might say, no more. They part here, the boy's body carried back to town by another, as the horse stays, says nothing, because horses don't speak. Besides, this one's dead. Uh, this next poem, just a little introductory note, uh, actually uh, came out because a friend of mine challenged me to write about running, which is something I do a lot of. Um, and I could never do it. It challenged me like four years before I had ever written this poem. And it wasn't until I had this moment where I was running um, in Austin, Texas, early in the morning, and a guy decided to follow me and shout, nigger, 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 as I was running. And so this poem sort of helped me write about, th that helped me write about running. <laughs> Cross country. When I ran, it rained niggers early in October. The first creases of autumn, a flag-weary sky in which yellow birds in flight slip through the breast bone of God and tear at the coarse threads that keep the morning knit tightly around his heart. What was it that they sang about the light? Their tongues, the thistles they pluck from the bitter bark of an all-thorn, then thrust into the breast of whatever God or good animal requires eating a good piercing. These blonde bodies thrashing about above me were death's idea of the morning passing. Here below this golden altar, the making and unmaking of my body. The kettle clank and souring sumac of a man yelling at the light, slipping in and out of my mouth. What name must I carry above the dust of this field? Bruised ear, blank body, purple tongue, bloody God bleeding, do you hear me? Deer piss and poison ivy made pungent by the dew and morning sun rising, do you hear me? When I ran, it rained, niggers. In a ditch along the road, a pair of wild boars slain and laid tusk to tail, point as if required in two directions at once, toward my body pressing the last bits of a hunter's moon into the tar of this road and away from the meadow red light coming up through the chaff, rising above this hectored field, and the man yelling, nigger and the cicadas tuning up to tear the morning into tatters, nigger and the squawk and clatter of a hen complaining of a hand reaching below her bottom and removing the warm work of a cold night, nigger in the reeds covering the muck of a beaver's hard birth, nigger in the blue hour of a field once wet with the, with the breath of a lone horse 
cracking along its flanks. Nigger in the fog lifting from this field and the steel birth it reveals. Nigger in the running, in the bog at the end of this road, in the war and in between the wars. Nigger in the pink salt and eyelashes of a woman I love, her mouth pulling water from behind my knee, pulling, pulling, pulling. Think nigger is the god of our brief salvation. Nigger in a body falling toward a horizon. Nigger in the twilight that is no longer a twilight, but a black creek fumbling along the spine of a boy who is running through a city that is running out of water. Even the lions have left for the mountains. This is America speaking in translation, in glitter, and gold grills and fried chicken. Auto-tune this if you must. Cher will be singing in the brush of static from the attic radio, believing in love after love or life after love, despite the impure thoughts of evening, despite the rain soaking the red head of a red bird, now dead in a puddle that refuses to reflect the moon. Uh, this next poem is actually the poem that I was writing when I was looking at the cover. I was spent a whole summer just looking at this Basquiat print, Charles I, and uh, at the bottom of it, he has, uh, most young kings get their heads cut off. And that phrase, I played with it a lot, and I, it, it meant a lot for me for some reason for the summer of 2009. So um, this poem is Some Young Kings. The Mike Tyson in me sings like a norwal minus the nasally twang of sleeping in a cold ocean. The unsightly barnacles latched to the mattress of skin just below my eye. The white horn jutting out from the top of my head. Oh God bless us mutts, the basset bloodhound mulattoes, the pugged mixed puppies left behind the dog pound cinder block walls as German shepherds, labradoodles, and Portuguese water dogs turn their inbred behinds and narrow backs at our small mouth blues. It's hard to smile with an ear in your mouth, two names and a daughter hanging by a thread from the railing of a treadmill. Oh, neck in North Carolina and a white coat of paint for all the faces of my Negro friends hanging from trees in Salisbury, Greensboro, Guilford County, the hummingbirds inside my chest with their needle nose pliers for tongues and hammer heavy wings have left a mess of ticks in my lungs and a punctured lullaby in my throat. Little boy blue can blow your horn, the cows in the meadow and Dorothy's alone in the corn with Jack, his black fingers, the brass of his lips, the half moons of his fingernails clicking along her legs until she howls, Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker. Oz is a man with a mute body on an HBO original show that I am too afraid to watch for fear of finding my uncle or a man that looks like my uncle, which means finding a man that looks like me in another man's embrace or slumped over a shiv made from a mattress coil and a bar of ivory soap. Most young kings return home without their heads. It's 1941 and Jack Johnson loves white women and my mother won't forgive him. If she can't use your comb, don't bring her home, my mother says in 1998. It's 2009 and I still love white women. Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker. Often I click the heels of my Nikes together when talking to the police. I am a cricket crushed beneath the car's balding black tires. Most young kings return home without their heads. Self-portrait as love in Mississippi. In Tupelo, Mississippi, cows forget their manners, mount each other out of season, despite frost stitching the split between their hooves, settling on their coarse hides, then cracking like a face below a boy's skate when they tup and tup and tup, the hook and bowl of their hips measured in sweat, then frost, frost sealing each leg hair into tiny spears that clatter against one another. We all understand these spears carried along our legs from a lover's bed back to a field or barn or cupboard where roaches click breast to armored back atop a bag of uncooked black eyes. Oh, these spears of love running along our legs, sometimes hanging from the sides of our mouths and long heavy ropes like the saliva falling from these cows' mouths, forcing them to carry their heads just above the mud as they turn from each other's sated bodies. God bless this forgetting, and the javelins we sink into each other's sides.
thinking of Anne Frank in the middle of winter. There's a boy whose face I've touched once, like these blackbirds peck and lick at frozen cat food sitting outside my door and pie tins that clatter against anything that will touch them. Eventually, they will drag their tinny bottoms across the driveway cement until they rest against a spigot's dry mouth, as if to say, whatever the price, I'll pay. A bruise, a sheaf of paper, an attic. Peter, where is the checkered suit you snagged against a stray nail when we lay together straighter than the attic boards that warped beneath us? How did we know this was not enough? A boot, a creak, a cloud of dust rising from a blanket that covered our shattering cheeks. Your lips moving against the back of my neck, even as I pulled away. Peter, I too love anything that reaches and fails. Um, this next poem is, uh, I always say, I would love to have battle rapped Rilke in a former life. Uh, I think he would have, I think Rilke would have talked a lot of mess. Uh, and so uh, this is called Brief Angel. Even Rilke bows to this lone black tree I have made in a South German forest. The sun's washed corpse leaking, the snow, a tired mouth opening beneath my feet, which says nothing of the owls falling heavy from heaven onto the necks of rodents. I fed you with this type of vision before, a white sheet, dead and flat as a god, descending from heaven, bearing all manner of wild beasts, four-footed and fettered, fish, fowl, eat. Nothing I set before you is unclean. Behold, I am him who you seek, slender black tree in a South German forest, tired mouth, white sheet, washed corpse. When was the last time you called the living to rise, walking them out of the orchard fires, past a lion who walks the walls of this city, lost in the snow and kerfluffle of your grief? What anger lurking in a piece of silk have you ignored? I have sent what terror I could, the head of a white tiger with a mouthful of black figs, a police captain whistling about a three-leg foal falling from heaven, and yes, a foal falling into a zero on a bed of straw and dung. Behold, I am him who you seek, brief angel, black fig, orchard fire, white tiger, lost lion, a song of coming destruction. Nothing I have brought before you is unclean. I am him who you seek, eat, even this palm stretched out before you, meat. When has a god ever sent bread that hasn't required a bit of breaking, a fig crushed, a body made to sing even as it is shattered? Uh, two poem warning. Uh, so the last one is called, the last, this last one is again me thinking through Keats a little bit. So this is called Romanticism, the Blue Keats. I want a terrace of bamboo, a stuttering harp, a garden fitted with a grotto and gimp hermit. I want to lose my last name in the crickets coupling beneath my feet. I want the body's burden, four more angels to drag through the streets of a city that finds the monkey sacred, the fool careful, the monk dumb. I want a painting of persimmons and a persimmon. I want the violence of my love to leave my sleep and my lover alone. I'm dedicated to the same baffled heart I have always carried, the diamonds and mud of my mouth, the midsummer lurching toward the late summer heat that will kill the sage and tomato plants tanning on the veranda. I want the water and the leg my uncle lost coming from the well. If one body will hide an another and call this hiding love, I want to always torture myself with another's wet borders, an ankle clicking against an ankle, the wrist fettered, there was something I knew before this, before my hands tore at the ropes, snapped cedar poles, and ripped the silk of any tent I lay in. I want to know how the savage wind loves the house it destroys. I want to know before I am both house and savage wind, before all of the tents in the city become tattered rags snagged in the hair of our children and the red-headed trees. I am careful to want nothing that I cannot lose and be sad in the losing a terrace made of rotting bamboo, a harp lost in its singing, my last name and the tomatoes falling from the vine. Woman, I want this plum heart and the dying that makes this possible. And this last poem is one of those like MFA poems. 
not MFA, like it's like an MFA poem, but it's one of those poems you write in your MFA program where you get real frustrated and you're just like, oh, these poems aren't amounting to anything, shit. Um, and so I was reading a lot of O'Hara and there was this line in one of O'Hara's poems that to me was tremendous, which is, he, he would, I, don't, I can't even remember the poem, but he says, someday I'll love Frank O'Hara. And I thought, that's such a bold thing and a beautiful thing to, to write in your own poem. So I thought I should start a poem that way. So it's called, Someday I'll Love Roger Reeves. Until then, let us have our gods and short prayers, our obligations, our thigh bone connected to our knee bone, our dissections and our swans, our legs gashed upon a barbed wire fence and our heels tucked behind a lover's knees. Let us have a stalk of sugar cane to suck and another to tear our backs with what it knows of disaster and a tadpole's folly. Let us have mistakes and fish willing to come to a bell rung across the body of water. Let us have our drawbridges and our moats, our heavens no higher than a pile of dried leaves. Let us have irrelevance and a scalpel, a dislocated ankle and three more miles to run, a plastic bottle to hold nothing but last names and a chill. If none of this will be remembered, then let us keep speaking with tongues, light as screen doors, clapping shut on a child's finger, for this is love. To press one frame against another, and when something like a finger is found between this pressing, to press nevertheless, for this is our obligation. Let us forget our obligations, for this is love. Let us forget our love. Our eyelids need for beginnings and ends and blood our coils of hunger that turn another into dried honey on our hands. And what if this goes on forever? Our hours, our drafts and fragments, our blizzards and our cancers. Then let us, then let us hold each other toward heaven and forget that we were once made of flesh, that this is the fall our gods refuse to clean with fire or water. Thank you. Beautiful reading. Um, thank you to the New School, to Kave Kanam, for this invitation to read in such stellar company tonight. Um, I'm reading from She Has a Name. And um, this collection is largely based on a family's journey um, with a daughter who has autism. Um, about the last third of the book, um, the subject matter varies, but most of the book does um, deal with that. And so I'll mainly be reading from that section tonight. Me and technology. All right. Borderless country. One and 150 now. This glitch in babies poised to unlock the world. These daughters and sons of poets, store clerks, salesmen, singers, CEOs, janitors, actors cast into this permanent script. Souls we love turned like the faces of flowers thrust toward a rogue sun. We are the earth we walk. What seeps here is the air fighting back, is the water slowing baskets down, sending them back upstream. Are we changing? Dear God, are they here to tell us in a way we can't ignore that we aren't changing fast enough? Autism, the one drop rule for minds we strain to understand. The catch all phrase that drops kids off at nowhere, at you don't exist once you turn 18, at native tongue of one, at white knuckled translation cobbled through touch across time, at marquee symptoms while causes lurk, at beauty that demands seas of patience. What about that drug I took once? Vaccines. Some karmic boomerang I don't remember throwing its stealth return. One in 150 apples of somebody's eye. One in 150, my baby. One in 150 now, a new child breeds. Private riddles of our loving strapped on many backs. That statistic, that statistic is now one in 88. Um, breach. It seems the most special of beings endure harrowing beginnings. 
The covering physician didn't know her body's history. He treated mama with less grace than a laboring mare, almost dragging her off the table, and she had no choice as he ripped my sister into this world. Parents, our child's mind is on lease to her from the stingiest of lenders. You can't tell this when her tiny lips break open, gourds of joy, her mouth a toothless shrine. Each year, we depreciate. We tell ourselves that if anything must spoil, let it be us. She's worth a million urges. Hope lies in the new. Everyone knows this. Father. The last thing I ever wanted was to let her down. I held her high in the bowels of my biceps until her legs began to grapevine around mine. She didn't wriggle like my older girls did, restless for ground, no. Lord, Lord, no, please, not my baby girl, not the one named after mama gone, mouth carved just like hers, like mine held her as long as any father's strength could stand her growing weight. What could I have done? What next? My chromosome limps in her bloodstream. The proof, years later, my brother's son scales this cliff. I'm not allowed to say I don't want to pay what she will cost us. I'll work myself into pulp, withhold my tongue, and practice nothingness cockroach logic. If I don't move, I'm not really against this wall, back gleaming in harsh light. I won't hold my wife's hand and skip words like stones. I'll become a dyke of a man, fall asleep in front of the TV nightly until I burst. Mother. I watched the backs of college girlfriends trailing off to mobile lives. I watched them until they were blips. Ours was a sacred exile then. Waterfalls of words between us, silhouettes in love, tending our own. The hours, clouds floating past, beds in the sky where rain slept. I often wake up dizzy, the sun mocking us as it douses her face. My husband says nothing. His kiss is shallow. What we don't say, we eat. Frequency and ultimatum. Who are you, damn it? Make yourselves known. Spooks and haints that speak only to her. Unholy chorus stalking the shoulders of my parents' third angel. Dog whistle voices take her away mid-sentence. Brazen cackles bar her from sleep. Headsets on the nightstand offer DJ chatter and quiet storm melodies just wide enough to drown them so she can sneak into rim unfettered by strange music. What do you say? Why can't I hush you when she bristles at your whispers? Decoding crests and troughs that wash past our ears, I must somehow tune in to the station on the mental dial where she listens to heavy air, my comprehension can't weigh. I wish my love static interfered with magnetic tongues luring her from herself. Find another mind or else. No room for gray. Between is a hard place to live. She shuns wheelchairs and mongoloid faces, mad that her mind will fight to keep her quarantined from her own car, yard, babies. You are or you're not. You're sick or you're well, one thing or another, but it's never that simple like breathing should be. Between is a hard place to live. Each morning, she stretches her fingers toward a life just out of reach and grudgingly squeezes into a seat at a table that bumps her knees. Firstborn. College is not Canaan, sis. Not a promised land to independence, to normal. Not etched in stone. 
Come down from your Mount Nebo of longing. Discover your own route to paradise. We'll meet you there. Directions. Don't drop your sister, ever, especially when I'm gone. I don't believe you care as much as I do. I want to, but how could you really? And should you? Gorgeous wind in your sails. But I need you to carry her, to want to carry her. Hold her hands on both sides, crossings ahead, swift and brutal. Never let her out of your sight like years ago in the park, in the mall, at the movies, like after church on the lawn when your father wasn't looking didn't correct those who only asked about the first two. Promise me she won't inhale the ammonia smell of group mess halls, wince at the prying fingers of hired help. Promise me, girls. Mother, cocooning her became everything. Cocooning means agreeing to become a shell. After cancer, recurrence, cells hobbled by chemo that has since been banned, side effects becoming front and center effects, we share a phantom cord, now a two-way lifeline. She tethers what otherwise would float apart. Wallet. When I was 18, I found your wallet in a drawer. I eased your freshman ID from the dark slit, smiled at the country hunk on the hairy lip of manhood staring back at me. You appear brooding, but those margarine eyes cooked a deep brown, tell another truth. Stuck to the other side, a photo booth shot of your uptown girlfriend, I have her nose. Daddy, you're fading, but there is still sheen. Snapped and tucked close, you unfold on occasion glimpses of stray ancient receipts. Out of pocket in your own house, you live in the sanctuary. Member of every committee, your voice soars through hymns. Gospel that rings out the soul, hangs sinners up clean and whole again. The robe hides everything that sags. Here, your sacrifices win praise. At home, glory isn't as clear. Tearing in places, you brace for each crisp new loss, and now so do I, your firstborn, stitching things together, carrying you with me everywhere I go. Firstborn. Waving, they stand behind the screen as they always have, sacred sentinels. When did it happen? The soul dry rot, the end of heavy breathing, the loss of their first names. Their bones and the arthritic dogwood limbs brace against each other in the yard, wavering in January wind without blooms. Each visit home frays me, the price I pay for being able to drive away. Watching a woman on the M101 Express. You sit in a hard blue seat, one of the ones reserved for the elderly or infirm, a statue of need. Your mouth open as if waiting for water or medicine, as if mugged mid-sentence, or some ice age hit right after terrible news. Oblivious to the metro's bump and buck, to the toddler begging in Spanish to be freed from her stroller, to my ogling. You sit embalmed, raccooned or moosed. You have the kind of eyes that never quite close, even in deepest sleep, lids an undersized t-shirt that leaves belly exposed. Tears navigate moles, veteran swimmers of your creek bed face. I can't stop looking. You can't get over whatever has happened, so shell-shocked that birds could land and roost. I want to ask just so you know someone is paying attention, but not enough to know what ravages. It's rude to stare. I'm from the South, a suburb where grief pulls the shades first, stays home if indecent. But your sorrow struts four rows down for me, 
strands you an astronaut on some distant, undiscovered moon. Bodies to your left and right read papers, nap, send text messages. You sit in a hard blue seat, mouth open. I study the pink of your jaw and wonder if you'll come back before your stop comes. Okay, I saw a drag queen in blackface, and so I was like, I need to write you a poem. So I'll share that. Um, this is called Dressing Down to Shirley Q. Licker. When you're gay and Dixie, you're a clown of a desperate circus. Sometimes the only way to be like daddy is to hate like him. Hope your brothers laugh instead of shoot. Wrap a Confederate skirt around your waist. You traded glamor for nasty tricks, dethroning your mammy's image for dollars that will never cover so much debt unraveling years she lost loving you for a living. Tailspin. They didn't plan on perishing like this. Somehow between the blurring of wings, nesting, settling on branches that snapped like twigs, a tumble began. Their black bodies plunge through a gape in the side of a crumbling house. What else can they do but stare at the rotten, growing mouth in the side of the tiny shack that, that swallows lives? Inside, the wife rouses. She hears their cries thin like the hours, talons whispering final rites. She clamors into the phone while her grown children sit on the other end of the line without words, summoning God. She shrieks at her husband, things are dying inside our walls. I know, he mutters, I know. He fought tailspin for years, still remembers flight. For a while they thought they could holler themselves back into the sky. I think I'm gonna end with this one. This is dust. Don't move this dust. My grandmother scratched upright, older than all of us, has always anchored this corner. Unplayable, tuned to scales that can't exist, now a weight keeping yesterday's pages from flying away. Everything's moving, turning into things we don't want or recognize. Don't budge our world or move this dust. Don't remind that eventually, everything goes slack and mute as the keys decoding decaying golden brown in the mouth of her piano. Stringed mausoleum where we prop our framed past. Sometimes we don't want what's best, we just want what was for better and worse. Often all we have are banged up blessings. Please don't move this dust that has danced in this air for thousands of mornings. Our mingled skins glitter caught in sunlight. Thank you. Thank you, Camila and Roger. Just extraordinary poems, very, very moving. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to introduce Kwame Dawes, a multifaceted artist who exemplifies and gives meaning to the phrase citizen poet. Actor, playwright, musician, broadcaster, producer, and a prolific award-winning writer in several genres, Kwame co-founded and serves as programming director of the Calabash International Literary Festival, the now iconic gathering in Jamaica that builds bridges among writers, readers, continents, countries, generations, and cultures. In 2009, he won an Emmy for LiveHopeLove.com, an interactive site based on his Pulitzer Center project, Hope, Living and Loving with AIDS in Jamaica a recipient of a People's Voice Webby Award. Kwame's many recognitions include the Forward Prize for Poetry, 
the Hollis Summers Prize for Poetry, Poets and Writers, Barnes and Noble Writers for Writers Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship for Poetry, and a Pushcart Prize for Poetry. The list goes on. The editor of many influential anthologies, he has published two novels and no fewer than 17 collections of poetry. Most recently, Duppy Conqueror, New and Selected Poems. Kwame is the Glenna Lushai editor of Prairie Schooner at the University of Nebraska, where he is a chancellor professor of English. He is, I'm delighted to say, a cherished Kaveh Kanem faculty member. Please join me in welcoming the indefatigable, brilliant, one love poet, Kwame Dawes. Thank you. Good evening. I hope you're doing fine. Yes? yes? All right. That's the plan. Because, you know, it could be worse. <laughs> it's a little indulgent listening to poetry, so it could be worse. Um, thank you all for coming out. and. It's always good to, to read in a Cave Canem gathering. Typically, people attend those, um, so that's nice. Um, but it's also good to be, to be part of, of an outfit that is pretty much taking over the entire American poetry establishment, <laughs> namely Cave Canem. And they're doing it honestly. They're doing it with great work. I mean, you just heard the reading tonight. This is what is happening. This is like the place where the poetry is really cooking. Seriously, it's, it's very disturbing, really, when you think about it. One place, one noise, beautiful. I love it. So I'm going to read some poems. And um, I'm dedicating this reading, and I've been doing this for a while, to my uncle, Kofi Awuna, who was killed in Nairobi at the Westgate Mall. We were there together for the Story Mojo Festival. And, um, and he went, I think, for coffee or something like that with his son. And he was caught up in that madness. And he was killed. I, I mention him now because I went to his funeral in Ghana a few weeks ago. And what was fascinating about that funeral was just how much it was about poetry. There are certain comforts that writers will leave with us. And um, I have a funny feeling that he planned to give us something to talk about. And one of the things he gave us to talk about was that before he traveled to, to, to Nairobi, he, he called his one of his people that he mentors, Kofi Anidaho, who is a major senior African poet, and, uh, and I think his son, and he, he gave them the plan for his funeral. He did the whole plan for his funeral. And then he went to Nairobi, and he was killed. But the funeral was striking because it was all poetry. It was all poetry. His children read all poems. There was no big dignitary reading eulogies or anything like that. It was all poetry. And if you know who Anido, I mean, Awona was, Awona was a major advisor to, to all the leaders in Ghana. He was an ambassador. Um, and so the funeral was packed with all these dignitaries, the president, everybody there, and none of them was asked to speak. And it was his joke. It was his way of saying, it's about poetry. That's what it's about. And that moved me and that touched me greatly. Um, he was a dear friend to my father. He was my father's best friend for many years. And he gave us great comfort when my father died. I'll read a poem by him, a short poem called Counting the Years. As usual, as in the earlier dreams, I come to the whistling shores, the voice of the high-domed crab stilled. But a chorus remains of the water creatures, of earlier times, of the birth time and the dying time. The pity when we resurrect the travelers, the anchorman 
on our singular boat that will take us home. Um, his book, New and Selected Poems, which the African Poetry Book Fund is publishing, um, that's why we were in Nairobi, actually, it will come out for AWP next year, and we'll have, a, we'll have at AWP a memorial reading for him. Um, get the book. It's stunning. It's amazing. I, I, I think he's just easily one of the greatest poets coming out, that has come out of Africa, um, period. I'm going to read some poems from um, Duppy Conqueror, and then I'll read a couple of new things uh, so, that, so that you can say that he read some new things. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just <laughs> that's all people are looking to say. He read new things. <laughs> Incidentally, if you are thinking of dying, um, what you should do <laughs> is do stuff like that, like tell people, I'm thinking of dying. Uh, which, which helps, because when people go to funerals, they can say, wow, he was thinking of dying. He said that to me. And then they have things to talk about. Just a thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. It sounds, it's really, I think you would. <laughs> okay. Elevator. For August Wilson. You learn faith in that elevator. Faith and service. Learn how to believe. Learn how to make others believe. Learn how to take people where they must go. Where they are scared to go. Away from where they have been. You learn to be the guide, the prophet. You teach them the constancy of God. You press a button, call out a number, and it will climb all the way up. Here you learn how to fly in the house. You reach into the heavenly places above it all, and you are Lord of your kingdom. Here where you can pray so close, so close, as close to a mountain top, and it isn't hard to hear the pain of people, see the bruises in a face, listen to the lament of those who want to fly some other way. Since the market crashed, since Roosevelt come out like a granddaddy and tell people to hold on, tell them how he's got something for you, you've seen how shiny a white man's suit can get how black his color, how worn down the heels of them women with their stockings painted to hide the holes or no stockings. And you feel like the angel in the architecture riding up and down. And you know that this is why a man must turn to God, build a church. Know that this is just the cage where a bird will sing. For you know how riding this box to heaven and then down to hell could teach you what it feels like for the Holy Ghost to light your head aflame and you know you want your sanctuary there in the neighborhood to be a box taking folks as high as they can go. Know at least where you can say you own this. You own this because you built it with your own two hands. This is the salvation of the preachers in this land of beasts who want to own you. Own everything you have, own the sweetness of every orgasm you howl, own the clock on your broken body, own your hallelujahs and your amens, and all you want to do is let your people own you, let them shelter you so you can give them the guiding. Be the elevator man, running them up to higher places, to the mountain top, to the open sky, way above the city of hands, scarred with the accidents of labor. This stretch of concrete and cold where a soul could lose itself, where a woman could slowly dry away to nothing, where she can forget the hymns in the rafters, the oil on hands laid gently on her, the grounding of soil, the truth of herself, the sucker of tears. A man knows the call of God to make him the preacher of faith. Just hold on. Hallelujah. Just hold on. Amen. Just hold on. We are going up. <clears throat> Thank you. News from Harlem. This is New York, right? This is Marcus Garvey's territory. This is a poem for Marcus Messiah Garvey. 
even here on the south side of this city of wind and blood, news is good for Negroes. A fat-faced, true African man, one of those black men you know, never ever had a doubt that he is a man and strong too. One of those magic men who know what God must feel like standing over an army of angels. One of those men who stood at the edge of the new century and seen a wide world of what could be. A man who, when he heard what Du Bois said about the color line, thought right off that this is going to be a century where everybody will be talking about niggers like they are new money. And he, sure as hell, is going to shine and shine. A man with two big hands and a head full of words who knows the freedom of nothing to lose. A man who knows the long legacy of rebels whose maroons whispering a can in the hills. Knife men, cutlass men, roots men, Congo men, those yellow-eyed quiet men who look at death like it is a good idea that someone came up with. A man who learned by touching the split chest of a white man, his heart still thumping, everything inside him slick with blood and water, his ribs pulled aside where the doctor tried. That ain't, that white man ain't nothing but flesh, old rotting flesh like everybody else. A man who's done the math and knows that for 50 years his people have been waiting for something bigger than themselves. Well, news has it that this man is causing trouble in Harlem. And the world won't be the same when he's done with it. Even here, the excitement of it is rushing through the blues joints, and people are strutting about like they have been marching, like they've been waving flags, like they shouting the name of freedom beside a round-faced black man with his proud, high voice showering imperatives on the folks who gather to hear him talk with his sweet island singing black man sweating, dressed clean with high color and good shoes. Yeah, this is good news walking because we all need a daddy, a man with a good firm voice, a man who knows what we must do to change this wearying world, a man with a head full of dreams of ships, seven miles of them coming into the gaping Hudson mouth, red, gold, and green flags flapping in the air, seven miles of ships as far as the eyes can see, coming in, coming in, coming in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that great tune? Seven miles of black star line are coming in the heart. It's a great reggae tune, man. If you know these things, you must know these things. If you don't know these things, you will die on the vine. Ah, in South Carolina, which I miss so much, you know, because I like Nebraska and all, you know, but there's not a lot of black people up in Nebraska. <laughs> um, and I miss the bodies. I miss the language of the bodies, you know. So every time I land in Atlanta, I just, I just feel happy. <laughs> to see black bodies moving. But South Carolina is a complicated place. And I remember in South Carolina, I went to visit a plantation. <laughs> this is the, like, the thing you do. Um, as, as the director of this outfit called the Poetry Initiative, we used to place poets in all kinds of places, pizza parlors and, and libraries and museums and all kinds of places. And so I was scouting a plantation because I wanted to put a poet there uh, to, 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 you know, to be in residence there. And um, so I, was, I joined a kind of tour, and it was being led by a very, very, very smart young woman. But it, it was curious because, of course, I was the only black guy there following this tour. And, um, and she was doing a fantastic job, but she kept leaving out, I thought, things that were kind of important. So I kept asking <laughs> really unfortunate questions like, so where were the slaves again? You know, things like that. Did, it, did the slaves live over, you know, so on and so forth. And um, uh, uh, you need to understand something. Most of the people on the tour, I would say all of them on the tour, I don't know if you know this, but there's a whole industry of, of weddings at pl on plantations. That's, 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 yeah, weddings. It's like going to Auschwitz and having weddings. Yeah, it's like. Anyway, um, so, so, because apparently it looks nice, you know, and you can look like you're in Gone with the Wind when you get married and so on and so forth. So, so this, is what, 
This is what they were there to do. So my questions were a little, I guess, inconvenient. They just weren't so. So I did it for a while, and then she said quite nicely, she said, maybe, maybe you should, should go to the main office. They might be able to help you. So I, I said, sure. So I went to the main office, and of course, I could hear the thunderous applause from the people left behind. I'm sure they were just going, who was that guy? Um, went to the office, and they were really helpful. A guy took me on a tour. He showed me all the slave houses and so on and so forth. And then he pointed to a tree that was standing right by a water, by the river, by a canal. And he says, this is what this tree they used to call the hanging tree. So this poem is called, How to Pick a Hanging Tree. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Lewis Allen. Young trees may look sturdy, but they have no memory. They are green so near the surface they bend with the sudden weight, and the truth is that not all trees can carry a dead man's weight with enough air between pointed toes and earth with enough height so the scent of rotten can carry far enough to be a message for those who are sniffing the muggy air for news. Old as it may look, craggy bark, twisted branches, drooping limbs, old as it may seem sitting there by the edge of the canal, that live oak understands the simple rituals of hanging. See, there is the natural notch where the rope will slip and hold, and here, angled like this, the damp air off the river carries the decay for miles and miles. Sometimes a fresh tree will simply die after the piss of a dying man seeps into its roots. Sometimes a tree will start to rot from guilt or something like a curse, but the old trees, seasoned by the flame of summer lightning and hardened to tears, know it is nothing to be a tree, mute and heartless, just strong enough to carry a man until he turns to air. Rope. To hold our lives together on the cart before the slow march after midnight along back roads, blind driving, the scent of the exhaust making us drowsy, every shadow in the fields a threat of sorts. We, are, we use rope thick as two thumbs side by side, pulling hard on the knot to keep our parts from falling by the wayside. We have kept this rope supple with oil, constant use, never letting it stay idle long enough to rot. It is hard to look at the coiled silence of our strongest rope and not think of what it has held the heavy gray green battered bucket knocking the stone sides of the well, top water spilling back down this cherished substance carrying our lives. The mare, white and gray, plodding across the wide open field at dusk, her head heavy with labor, the rope a caress against her neck. The way she turns toward a gentle tug, we hold the balance of our need in thin rope, the dead weight of June bog at dawn, his skin still steaming, his black, beautiful skin catching the morning light, tender among the leaves, how we found him there, his neck stretched, the wrapping of several yards of taut rope around the drooping branch where we found it, how we undid the knot, let his body down into our arms, then carried it like a soldier's flag, bearing it behind the cart, shaking along with his swollen body. This ordinary rope, this gift we cannot forget, this remembrance of what we have lost. Someday, a soul will come out of the fields to claim it, and then we will know. Okay, I have two more poems. Um, the first one is a poem called If You Know Her. It's a poem that is not about my wife. It's not. But I wouldn't be able to write it if I wasn't married to my wife. But it's not about my wife, right? They're recording this. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not about her. Okay. If you know your woman, Know her rhythms, know her ways. If you're paying attention to her all these years, you will know how she comes and goes, how she slips away even though she is standing in the same place. You will know that her world is drifting softly from you and she may not mean it because all it is is she's scared to be everything 
scared to be finding herself in you every time, scared that one day she will ask herself all 40 plenty years of her where she's been. If you know your woman, you will know that mostly she will come back, but sometimes when she drifts like this, something can make her slip, and then coming back is hard. If you know your woman, you can tell by the way she puts on heels and she does not sachet for you because it's not about you. How she will buy some leather boots and not say a word about it and you only see it when she walks in one night and she says she's had them forever. And you will see the way she loses the weight and pretend it's nothing. But when she isn't seeing you looking, you can see how she faces the mirror, lifts her chest to catch a profile and how she casually looks at her ass for signs of life. If you know your woman, when you are gone, she will find things to do, like walk alone, go see a movie, find a park, collect her secrets, and you won't know because she's looking for herself. And she won't tell you that she wants to hear what idle men say when she walks by them because what you say is not enough. If you know your woman, you know when she's going away and you will feel the big hole of your love and you can't tell why she's listening and humming to tunes you did not know she heard before. And she will laugh softly at nothing at all. If you know your woman, you will see how she comes and goes. You will see how she comes and goes and all you can do is wait and pray she will come back to you. Because you know that your sins are big enough for her to leave and not return. I'll end with a poem which is for my wife. That's definite now. So this is called The Egg and the Teacup, and it's for Lorna, my wife. Um, I, a thought that came to me is if poets are able to scrutinize the world with that scalpel of language an insight, but never turn that scalpel in some ways on themselves, then they failed at some craft, at some moment, at some ability to, to truly discover and risk. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. So the egg and the teacup for Lorna. One. Perhaps I should have asked your father for your hand, and perhaps, oh, by the way, it's in six parts, so now you know. So, <laughs> so I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So when I get to five, it means it'll be soon over, okay? And, and then I'll be done, all right? Six parts. <laughs> People need to know this kind of stuff. <laughs> you have trains to catch and all that. All right, egg and the teacup for Lorna, one. Perhaps I should have asked your father for your hand, and perhaps he should have said no, just to show us he could. Then we would not wonder if it mattered at all to him. We might not have felt so on our own. Two, they never made it to your wedding. A cousin had one too, and they had to go, they said, and they did. And you, they thought, could take it, and we, they thought, could handle it, so we did. He may not have meant to, but he taught me not to fear your body broken easily. But you were strong, weren't you? It takes years, years to learn how much you've longed to be the fragile one, the delicate vessel. Three. And this was my betrayal, to think you could take it while I cupped the fragile catastrophes of others for my vanity and the lie of misplaced care. Forgive me, forgive me. I'm learning the language of husbandry, how to tend beauty, to listen to the power of a broken thing, a cup, some china, almost transparent, two broken pieces in a bed of soil, gleaming. Four. Not that you ever tried before. I simply chose to read it as your stoic way. You binging on a box of jelly-filled donuts devoured in front of me and always followed by the coolness of insouciant accusation, the firm pushback alone. 
you would command, and I fled. You tested me so often, and I failed you. Still, you gave me an open door, as if you thought your test too hard, too advanced for me. How we compromise for love, how we survive. I am grateful for those vivas retesting beside, inside our hot house, my hands learning to caress. Five, you did not hesitate, I know, to face the violence of cancer. It looked as if the body could at last show me your wounded self, and I would see how tenderly you wanted me to touch you inside, far inside. So it was not the fear of death, nothing like that, just the knowledge of how it is written that these things hidden in the dark will be revealed. I see you now. I hold you gingerly. I will learn you. I will. Six, harder than a stone, but more fragile than an egg. As if in the dark of youth, one can tell them apart. The egg from the thunder egg. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, our audience. And could we have one more round of applause for an extraordinary night of poetry? Thank you, Camila, Roger, and Kwame. We won't forget this night. I hope everyone can stay for a bit to meet the poets, enjoy beautiful refreshments provided by our generous host, The New School. Please visit the book table to purchase and have signed for your library a copy of these three amazing books of poetry. Um, sign our mailing list if you're not on it. Oh my gosh, you need to hear from Cave Economy at least once a month to know what we up, we're up to and to also give us donations, which we always welcome. Uh, I think that's it for tonight. I hope you will all come back for Poets on Craft with Natalie Handel and Avan Jordan. Thank you, poets. Thank you, audience. Thank you, New School. Thank you.